Singapore's newest desalination plant is also the only one that's capable of treating both sea and fresh water. We get the latest on Singapore's very own COVID-19 vaccine when we speak to Duke NUS Professor Wee Eng Yong. And Jimmy Teo, a co-founder of 12 Cupcakes, pleads guilty to underpaying foreign staff. Welcome to The Big Story, coming to you live from The Straits Times newsroom. I'm Olivia Kuei. I'm Harian to demand you can subscribe to The Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. A boy believed to be a 15-year-old student from ACSI has died after he fell during a high element activity at Safra Yishun yesterday. While well, high element activities are sometimes used as part of school camps and it may involve participants clearing obstacles at a height while wearing safety equipment. The Straits Times understands he was taking part in the school activity organised by Camelot, which is an outdoor adventure learning company. Following the incident, uh, the instructors were questioned by the police, but no foul play is currently suspected. The boy was taken to hospital after the incident and died this morning. In other news, Singapore's water security has been strengthened with the opening of our fourth desalination plant. The Keppel Marina East desalination plant is the only one here capable of treating both sea and reservoir water. The facility, about the size of two football fields, can draw water from the sea during periods of dry weather or treat water from the marina reservoir during periods with heavy rain. The plant can treat about 30 million gallons of water a day or up to 7% of Singapore's daily water needs. It's been operational since last June and was officially opened today by Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong. Well, Singapore's first assisted living public housing project for seniors was among the 3,740 BTO flats launched today. The new flats are spread across seven, seven housing projects in Bidadari, Kalang Wampur, Bukit Batok and Tenga. The housing project for seniors is at Harmony Village at Bukit Batok, where 169 community care apartments are on offer for those 65 years old and above. These units are expected to be completed in the second quarter of 2024 and will come with senior-friendly fittings like grab bars and a wheelchair-accessible bathroom. 12 Cupcakes co-founder Jamie Teo today admitted failing to prevent the company from underpaying foreign workers. As a director of the firm, she allowed 12 Cupcakes to underpay almost $100,000 in salaries of seven foreign employees. Teo will be sentenced on February 25th. Now, meanwhile, 12 Cupcakes' other co-founder and Teo's ex-husband, Daniel Ong, is set to return to court on the 16th. Twenty-two new COVID-19 cases were confirmed today. All were imported and placed on stay-home notice or isolated upon arrival in Singapore. Uh, more details will be released tonight. Well, we learned yesterday that the first shipment of Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine is expected to arrive in Singapore around March. This after the Health Sciences Authority approved it for use here. As a condition for the interim authorization, Moderna is required to monitor the long-term efficacy of the vaccine to determine the duration of protection against COVID-19. Moderna is also required to continue following up on the safety of the vaccine for a longer period of time to determine its full safety profile. The Moderna vaccine is the second COVID-19 vaccine to be authorized for use by the HSA after the one by Pfizer-BioNTech. There are differences between the vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer, like efficacy, the period between the first and second dose, as well as the minimum age of who can get each vaccine. Right, well, here to share more is Professor Wee Eng Yong. He's the Deputy Director of Duke NUS Medical School's Emerging Infectious Diseases Program. Welcome back, Professor. So, as Jan mentioned, there are differences between Moderna's and Pfizer's vaccines, but how significant are these differences actually in terms of what the vaccine is supposed to do? Yeah, no, uh, thanks for having me again. Um, I think for, for the person receiving the vaccine, I mean, uh, in, in, in Singapore, these differences are very minor and, and effectively, the, we can always think of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine as being very similar. 
they are similar in terms of the efficacy. I mean, one is 94%, the other one is 95%. Uh, in terms of the, the, the average. But if you look at the, the uh, spread of the data, then there's a lot of overlap. What it means is that there's not much difference between these vaccines. The, the side effect profile is also very similar. Um, you know, injection site pain, and soreness, uh, maybe a bit of tiredness, uh, headache, and some people may get fever. So it's a very common side effects of um, uh, that we've we, that we would encounter with any other vaccine anyway and certainly very similar between the Pfizer and Moderna um, so from from the uh, 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 Singapore public's uh, point of view we, should, we can think of this as uh, no no difference uh, no no significant difference between these two vaccines There'll be some who will compare both vaccines uh, when Moderna's shot becomes available. Now, given that we can't choose which vaccine is administered, Prof, what's your advice for those concerned about which vaccine they'll get? Yeah, I think my, my advice would be, don't worry about which, uh, which uh, uh, vaccine you're getting, whether it's from Pfizer or Moderna. In terms of the protection, in terms of the um, side effects and all that, they are pretty much... I mean, as, as you pointed out, one is just uh, three weeks apart, the other one is four weeks apart. It was just how the, the clinical trial was done. It was not like these were optimized, that one works better, uh, you know, in a three-week interval and versus a four-week interval. The, the, the clinical trials were, you know, we, they, the companies, like, like many others, tried to move it as fast as possible. So it doesn't mean that this uh, three weeks is better than four weeks or four weeks better than three weeks. There's, there's nothing in it. So in terms of the way we think about it, it, it should be the same. Uh, in terms of who can receive the vaccine and who cannot, it's probably going to be very similar because both of these vaccines are also RNA vaccine. Um, they are pitched in lipid nanoparticle. So in terms of um, you know the likely side effects, the likely uh, allergic reactions and all that, it's probably... Uh, uh, and therefore, who can get and who cannot get, mm. pretty much going to be the same. Uh, so, uh, you know, nothing separates. There's very little that separates these vaccines. Right. Well, Prof, I don't know whether this is a related question, but back in November, Health Minister Gan Kim Yong, he said that some vaccines may be effective for different segments of the population. So when both vaccines are available, how will our vaccination rollout change, you think? For, for example, will Moderna's vaccine be reserved for certain groups and Pfizer's for other groups? Uh, I don't think so, because in terms of, you know, um, the, the kind of vaccines that they are, so both RNA vaccine and how they are packaged, is, they are very similar. Now, uh, from a scientific point of view, for people like me, then yes, you know, it'll be interesting to ask what are some of the nuances in the in these vaccines that could have um, you know, help us understand uh, RNA vaccines better and perhaps build better vaccines for the future. But that that's for you know nerds like me, I guess. You know, the, for, for the general public, there's really nothing uh, in it. I think what Minister Gan may be referring to also is that there are a lot of other vaccines in the pipeline, right? From uh, AstraZeneca, from Johnson & Johnson, from Novavax. Uh, so these uh, vaccines are now come in different um, uh, platforms. So we're made from uh, using different platforms, right? Um, so AstraZeneca is, uh, and, and Johnson & Johnson, they both use adenovirus to carry the, the spike gene. Novavax is just a spike protein. And so because of the differences in how these vaccines are made, and therefore now we perhaps can think of, okay, those who are allergic to the RNA vaccines or components of the RNA vaccine, then perhaps we can you know, assign them to receive uh, these other forms of vaccines. So, so I think those will, will, will um, we can think about all that when those vaccines become licensed. Right now, we only have uh, either Pfizer or Moderna. I see. Right. You know, on the topic of uh, myriad uh, vaccines, we know that your team at Duke NUS is also developing a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, Prof, tell us, you know, what's the latest there? So we are right now in phase two clinical trial. Uh, that is, uh, uh, we are enrolling uh, uh, healthy volunteers as we speak. Uh, so the tr phase two trial is conducted both in Singapore as well as in the United States. Uh, it's, it's going very well and uh, we hope that you know, with the uh, phase two data, we can then move towards uh, phase three clinical trial, you know, around the second quarter, the middle of this year. 
uh, and then have uh, you know uh, efficacy data, um, you know maybe around the third quarter, and hopefully we'll be able to have a licensed vaccine before the end of the year. Wish you all the best, Prof, and thank you so much for taking time off to speak with us. We really appreciate your insights. That was Professor Ui Eng Yong, Deputy Director of the Emerging Infectious Diseases Program at Duke NUS Medical School. In the global headlines, Myanmar's junta blocked Facebook and other messaging services today in the name of ensuring stability following the February 1st coup. Its Ministry of Communications and Information said the online platform will be blocked until February the 7th to curb fake news and misinformation online. Used by half of Myanmar's 53 million people, Facebook is the main internet platform for much of the country and underpins communications for business and government. From today until February 17th, four areas in the Malaysian states of Trangano and Perak are under the Enhanced Movement Control Order after a surge in COVID-19 cases. Residents there are forbidden from exiting their homes. Visitors are not allowed to enter these areas and all businesses will have to be shut down. Senior Minister Ismail Sabri Yaakob said the restrictions will allow authorities to carry out targeted screening and place measures to control infection rates. Based on data by Oxford University, there are now more people vaccinated against COVID-19 than those infected by the virus. 104.9 million vaccine doses have been administered, which is 800,000 more than the number of global cases. Israel has given the most number of shots, having administered enough doses for 28% of its population. Despite the landmark data, it remains unclear how long it will take to vaccinate the entire world, and many of those vaccinated have received only one of two doses required. Meanwhile, Britain is testing the immune responses generated if doses of vaccines from Pfizer and AstraZeneca are combined in a two-shot schedule. The trial will not assess the overall efficacy of the shot combinations, but will measure antibody and T-cell responses, as well as monitor for any unexpected side effects. Initial data on immune responses is expected to be out around June. In Australia, Victoria's state health officials believe the 520 tennis players and support staff connected with the Australian Open are at a relatively low risk of having been exp exposed to the virus. All had served quarantine at the Grand Hyatt Hotel, where a hotel worker tested positive for COVID-19. The case also sparked new restrictions in Melbourne, with the city returning to mandatory masks indoors, as well as a 15-people cap on gatherings. It's Thursday, which means it's time for this week's Life Picks. Now, Olivia, I know you're not opposed to tattoos, right? But have you considered getting one that is hand-poked? Hand-poked? Mm. I don't know, honestly, because it sounds like it'll take longer, but the technique could actually be more precise. Mm, yeah, but I think we have to hear more from travel correspondent Clara Locke. So, Clara, what are the pros and cons uh, of hand-poked tattoos when we compare it to, you know, the more common uh, ones that use um, the electric guns. So artists and customers that I spoke to both say that um, the process of getting a hand poked tattoo overall feels less intense and for some that means it's less painful because when you get a tattoo with an electric gun, it's basically the gun controlling the needle and can go really fast. So the process might be over quickly but some people can feel intimidated by you know the buzzing and it's overall you know quite a stimulating experience and for some people that's a little bit a little bit scary. So for hand poked tattoos, some customers say it's actually quite calming. Um, artists have said they've had people fall asleep during the process. Some people compare it to removing blackheads and you know all that sounds very innocuous for something like a tattoo. So um, I think it depends on whether you prefer something that's quick and over fast or a kind of more gentle sensation that's going to be drawn out. So one of the artists I spoke to who does both hand poke and electric tattoos says that uh, hand poke tattoos can take about three to five times longer. Um, so it really just depends on what you're more comfortable with and what you think is going to be a more pleasant experience. Mm. Traditionally, this hand poking technique uh, is used for spiritual and religious tattoos like uh, cultures in, uh, for example, the Maori people in New Zealand, right? right? 
Uh, you spoke to a few hand uh, poke tattoo artists here as well, like you mentioned. Where do they get the inspiration uh, for these tattoos? For a lot of artists, I think they get inspiration from the things they see around them, um, the things they experience, and, and the things that they're growing up. So a lot of hand poke tattoos, because they take so, so much longer than electric ones, the tattoos that people want generally are quite small, between 3 to 5 cm. But there are also artists who want to push themselves to do bigger pieces because it allows for more creative expression. Mm. I think if you're choosing an artist, you know, it also depends on what they like and what you like and then you try and find a good match. Yeah, of course. Well, uh, Clara, uh, do these uh, hand poke tattoo artists need a license to operate? and? When it comes to hand poke tattoos, um, are there any potential hygiene or safety issues? So the tattoo industry in Singapore is not regulated, but the artists I spoke to, they all are very aware that they want to uphold a high standard of safety and hygiene. So um, they learn these things through the same places they, they picked up their tattoo skills. So they learn it on the internet, on YouTube, on Reddit, and um, almost all of them have tattoos themselves. So they've seen how it's done at a tattoo studio. You know, how the uh, how the tattoo studios would disinfect the bits and, and only use new needles. And so these are all things they recreate when they're doing it either in their home studios or in studios that they've set up for themselves. And um, I think overall, the sentiment is that um, they are aware of the risks and of course the risk involves the same things that you would risk you know when you're getting an electric tattoo like you can get a skin infection um the, you could get scarring at the tattoo site but um overall they try to maintain high hygiene standards because even though uh, hand poke tattoos are quite new to singapore or at least new among you know these young people who are picking up this craft they want to establish it as something serious as something proper that they can create into careers and that's why they hold themselves to a high standard Thank you, Clara. We've been speaking to our travel correspondent, Clara Long. Now, you can read more about these hand-poked tattoo artists on StraitsTimes.com. Jan, it's almost time for dinner. I hope you're not too hungry because you'll be in agony for the next few <laughs> minutes as we have the Straits Times food editor, Tan Xue Yun, here to talk about artisanal pizzas. Xue, I saw some Hello. of the photos that you sent and they look absolutely so yummy. So artisanal yes. pizzas, uh, they're making a comeback. Uh, in what ways are they different from those sold at, you know, um, the, the chain stores? Okay. Well, the thing, the thing is that they're not really making a comeback. They're actually mm, kind of making a debut. Uh, I mean, you know, you have really, you have, we have had really good pizzas at Mozza um, and a couple of other places. But um, see, these new uh, pizza places are um, kind of opened by Singaporeans, you know. And um, what differentiates their pizzas from the chain ones are that the dough is fermented over many hours, sometimes 48 hours, sometimes, you know, more than 12. And that long, slow fermentation develops flavour in the dough and um, honestly the dough is sometimes even more important than the topping. Chubi uh, sticks a lot to the plastics so um, you know they, they, their dough, a lot of these places they serve um, pizzas with Neapolitan style dough so Neapolitan mm. in Naples is where pizza began right. They have a couple of other ones of uh, pork, pork uh, for people who want a little bit more uh, a little bit uh, a, a more elaborate pizza topping um, then with 4am and uh, smalls they just go nuts with the toppings so um, recently at uh, at 4am I had a breakfast pizza which had um, bacon uh, tater tots scrambled eggs and a lot of other things and it's delicious so it, it really um, depends on, on, on how much of a purist you are, um, you know, whether or not you, you like something which is quite minimal um, so that you can focus on the dough or if you like the artistry and um, the inventiveness of uh, some of the, uh, the pizza purveyors these days and, and they are not afraid of, you know, just going for it and, and doing very daring topics. Mm. All right. You know, Shred, there are so many to choose from. I have to ask you, what are some of your favourites? Okay. Um, I I really like 4am pizza. Okay. Um, the 
I, I kind of think that the best pizza in Singapore, the best, absolute best pizza in Singapore is at Casa Nostra. That is a private dining business and you cannot get a seat or a table for love or money because it is so fully booked out, right? Um, so Antonio, who runs Casa Nostra, he consulted uh, on the 4am pizza dough and the the foreign pizza dough is not exactly like his, but it's very close and it's and, and the dough is fantastic. And I love the 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 creative way in which they, they think about the toppings and the flavors. So that that would be my pick. Well, thanks for whetting our appetites there, Xue. That was Tan Xue Yun, food editor for The Straits Times. We have a long weekend coming up next week and journalist Jen Lee is here to share more about a film that's just been nominated for four Golden Globes, including Best Motion Picture Drama Category. Well, Yon is talking about Promising Young Woman starring Carrie Mulligan. Jen, we know you're very excited to catch this one. As Yan said, it's been nominated for four Golden Globes. What are the strongest points in this film? Okay, so um, it's actually a, a like sort of rape revenge film, which sounds like a bit odd on the surface, I know, but it's basically about this young woman promising, you know how in rape cases people always call the perpetrators of sexual assault promising young men to try and like, um, you know, say like what they've done is not as bad to ruin their future. So like the title is a bit of a trope, like a play on that. So it's called Promising Young Woman. So it's about this woman who basically dropped out of medical school uh, due to some sort of unspecified trauma at the start of the film. You will find out what it is late as the film goes on. And um, it's just like about how she pretends to be drunk at class and she hopes guys who are trying to take advantage of the fact that she's drunk. And then when they bring her home, she like sobers up and the men are like really scared that she'll hurt them or something. So over the course of the film, you'll find out why she dropped out of med school. You'll find out why she's embarked on this journey of like vigilantism almost. And Jen, the film talks about sexual assault, uh, not an easy subject to navigate. How does the film fare in this aspect? Um, from like early reviews that I've read, um, people have said that the screenplay is very, very strong. So that's also nominated um, for a Golden Globe. Um, the screenplay is written by, and the film is also directed by, Emerald Fennell, who, if you watch The Crown, you'll notice that she's Camilla Parker Bowles, like she plays Camilla Parker Bowles. Um, and I think the script is very strong, that's what I've heard. And I've also heard that the film is very much about just like female rage, which it centers on how angry the, the woman at the center of the story is and why she's so angry. And it also looks at how different, different parts of society, different people, including women, help um, people to get away with sexual assault, help to downplay the intensity of it. And I think that's a, that's a pretty interesting way of like, you know, looking at um, sexual assault to, um, to frame it as a rape, right? To frame it as a, a rage um, issue, because why shouldn't, you know, women be angry about this, this thing, mm. right? You know, we try, to, we try to not come across as emotional. We try to not come across as angry because we want to be rational. We want to reason with people, but you should be angry about mm. these things, you know? Yeah. Well, now I'm intrigued with the movie. Yeah, well, I think to check it out. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Jen, for sharing. We've been speaking with journalist Jen Lee. Well, Promising Young Woman will be out in local cinemas on March 18th, but you can catch sneak previews in select cinemas from tomorrow to Sunday, as well as over the Chinese New Year holidays. Well, you can check out the Friday pages as well in tomorrow's live section for more ideas on what you can do this weekend. Well, for more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Harian Tudiman with Olivia Kuei. Join us tomorrow for more stories on The Big Story.